Hi, this is Miss Litton, and this is still my wonderful period one AP bio class. Say hi. Hi. All right, so we are moving on to part two of chapter 18. Chapter 18's title is The Origin and History of Life. So we're moving into part two, The History of Life. And we're starting out with fossils, and fossils tell a what? Story. 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 An awesome story. All right, so most fossils are found in sedimentary rock. Where does sedimentary rock come from? Settlements. Settle. Okay. Usually, to form sedimentary rock, you're probably going to have some sort of water that is wearing away molecules that are settling into a body of water. But it could also be layers of sand, right? If the wind is blowing them, and that could create layers. But most of the time, it's going to be in um, bodies of water. And you're making the assumption that the layers on the bottom are older, and the layers on top are newer. Okay. Now. You can find fossils in that sedimentary rock. And there are things like index fossils that you only found at certain times, like trilobites or whatever, that you only find at a certain um, period of, of life on this planet. But you can make fossils in other ways as well. And so I just want to run, other than sedimentary rock, um, things like, um, oh, there is a trilobite, um, amber. Okay, so amber um, comes from tree sap that hardens, and I think we've talked about that. You're not going to find a polar bear fossil in amber, right? Um, these are things that are small that can get stuck in the tree sap. Um, here are some other types of fossils. They could be imprints, so it doesn't have to be the actual structure, but what was left behind. And I will actually pass around. These are some fossils from my, um, where I grew up. If you are familiar with, <laughs> okay, I'll go back to those other ones. But if you are familiar with where Pass Robles is, do you know where that is? Pass Robles, San Luis Obispo, do you know where those areas are? Are those on the coast? No. Okay, but these were pulled out of rock layers in Paso and then again in Shandon, which is farther inland. Um, and you have things called molds and things called casts. Now what a mold would be is if a clam died or something like this, you have an outline of it. That would be a mold, and then the clam deteriorates. Then if some other mineral fills in that spot, now it's like you have a replacement of the original. That would be a cast. Okay, so here's a couple. Please be very, very careful with these. We'll pass them down, up, and down, okay? So just because they came from my family. And then this one was pulled out of a riverbed right below uh, the house. And they found a, um, a whale, um, part of a whale skeleton, or, or fossils. And do you remember how we talked about phalanges? Yes. This would be like a phalange. So this would be like where the, the bone would be of a, one of your digits, like right here. Okay. And then you can see like the demarcation here and the demarcation here of where it would end. Maybe connective tissue would be here. Where's the big ones? The big ones? Oh, these are other like fevers and stuff. Like when like a cow would die or something, you just buried it or like, um, you know, things with or a horse or something like that. So my brothers would always, if they were farming and found one, they would always bring them to me. So these are just from the ranch. If you want to look at these, you can't see, I don't care, but you guys are. And then, I bought this one at a store. Okay, so I'll pass that one around too. It's from a store. All right. So, come back to me because we need to hurry. They have found whole, like, intact mammoths where people literally have found these mammoths. It's like meat in your freezer for a long time, they, where they have hair that they've removed from it, where they can do DNA analysis. People have actually cooked frozen mammoth meat and eaten it. Yeah. yeah. Um, here are insects in amber. Um, here you can see, um, yes, in ice. 
Um, here is a petrified salmon who looks very scary to me. Scary salmon. I've talked to you about molds and casts. Um, imprints, when it's something is left behind from that organism. Um, here is one found in sedimentary rock. It's a bulldog fish. Look at how many men are holding this up that they found it. Huge, huge fish. Um, so then that takes us to dating. So go on your notes. Majority of fossils are found in sedimentary rock. If we took all of time okay, on Earth and we put it on a 24-hour clock, if you look, the Earth diagram will illustrate that only single-celled organisms were present um, during 80% of the Earth's time. And even less than that, take a look right here. If this is a 24-hour clock and this is 12 midnight, here's the formation of the Earth, oldest known rocks. We move into the Precambrian period, oldest fossils right here, okay, at 5 a.m., oldest fossils, if we put it on a 24-hour clock. First photosynthetic organism, still in the Precambrian period. One second equals 52,000 years in our 24-hour clock. One second is 52,000 years. Uh, keep going, keep going. We don't have the oxygen revolution until about 1 p.m. And then you keep going. We're still in the Precambrian period. Oldest eukaryotic fossils around dinner time. Keep going, keep going. Oldest multicellular fossils around 8 or 9 p.m. So if we think of the Earth, eyes are up here. If we think of the Earth and all of its time, you didn't even get a multicellular fossil starting at midnight until 9 p.m. the next day, okay? Then we have land plants, age of dinosaurs, and then first appearance of Homo sapiens, Homo sapiens, 11.59 and 30 seconds. So we put all of Earth's all of Earth's time on a 24-hour clock, we evolved in the last 30 seconds, okay? So fairly recent. How would you see this? You would look at rock layers, primarily fossils, and you need to be able, you can do relative dating where you have a general idea, like layer on the bottom is older than layer on the top. Then you can do absolute dating, where you know how fast isotopes break down. Um, Carbon-14, a half-life of carbon-14 is around 5,730 years, and half of it will break down um, into nitrogen-14. And so you can tell by how much of that isotope is remaining in that sample, how old it is, um, and that would be called absolute dating. And from using a combination of those tools, they're able to predict then when each of these things occurred. And that's where we want to get to when we go and work through. So two main types of dating. Um, relative dating, order of events, this, is, this layers on the bottom are older than the layers on the top. And then absolute dating is actual age of the event. Okay, now I know you're passing the fossils and I'm glad, but we need to make sure we're focused up here, okay? So let's go through absolute dating, or oh, here's relative dating. And now let's talk about absolute dating. It's the rate of decay, how fast something decays. So if at the current time, if right now, if I know that this much of a sample, let's say my hand, okay, my whole hand represents how much carbon is in something. If I assume at this current time that everything consists of carbon-12, the one, the most common isotope, and just my pinky nail is carbon-14, you with me on that? Then if I find a sample that has half of a pinky nail, then I can tell, oh, it's probably about 5,730 years because that's how, old it, how long it takes for half of a pinky nail to deteriorate, right? If I get a quarter of a pinky nail, now it's 5,730, do you see what I'm saying? If I have an eighth of a pinky nail, then by looking to see how much of that one isotope, because I know how fast it decays, by how much of it I have left, I know how old that sample is, but the problem is I'm gonna run out of pinky nail, right? So you can have to use different isotopes to age different things based on how fast they decay. Okay. So that would be what absolute dating is. Half-life is the time it takes for half that sample to decay. So here, I have a question for you. 
can you put these pictures in order based on rate of decay? All lowercase, no spaces, youngest to old, oldest. Take the letters and put them in the correct sequence. This is how I spend my life. <laughs> but first I had to Google a thousand pictures of girls in hats, or ladies in hats. <laughs> Just, do you see how it's similar? But can we tell based on rate of decay? Yes. You're just doing that using isotopes, and the right answer was what? H. H. So we're trying to use rate of decay in order to determine the absolute, what did some people put? <laughs> Look at clickers. If they don't show your clicker right now, you better ring that shame bell. Ring that shame bell up. Okay, um, light shirted bio buddy, explain this diagram, please. Go ahead, light shirted bio buddy. Majority of fossils found in sedimentary rock. Number two, the 24 hour clock at 12 midnight, the earth forms. At 5 a.m., we have our first cell. Jump to 10 p.m., that's the invasion of land. And what are you putting down at 11, 59, and 30? Appearance yeah, appearance of Homo sapiens. Um, on dating, relative, only when you're in a pinch and you really want to go to prom. <laughs> um, older layers at the bottom. <coughs> older layers at the bottom. And then on absolute dating, relies on radiometric techniques, speed of isotope breakdown. Speed of isotope breakdown. Yes? Like, I understand how I should have worked. I need you to be quiet, please. Shh. Go ahead, I'm listening. Um, I understand how it works, but how does... Like, how do you know what the half-life of each element is? Oh, because they can see, measure rate of decay, and then amplify it, how much of it would have decayed in this amount of time. Yeah. All right, so now we're going to take relative dating, absolute dating, and we're going to set up our geologic time scale. Okay? And this is a super simplified version of the geologic time scale. So you can see there are different periods in here, and then we have the Paleozoic era, the Mesozoic era, and the Cenozoic era. Everything below, at, before the Paleozoic, these all together, are known as the Precambrian. Why are they called the Precambrian? Because the first period in the Paleozoic era is the Cambrian period, so anything before that is what? Precambrian. Okay. So all life, and then up to this point we have Paleozoic, and the way I remember this is it's old and pale. Okay, old and pale. Mesozoic is in the middle, and Cenozoic is the center of your world now. Okay? Now let me tell you, Cenozoic is right now, and it goes back to around 65, 67 million years ago. It depends on the book that you're reading currently. The center of your world now. What are you learning how to do? Drive. drive. How fast can you drive on the freeway? 65 million, 65 million years fast, right? <laughs> so that's how I remember that, because it's now, 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 back 65 million years ago. That's when the Cenozoic era started, was 65 million years ago, which means the Mesozoic era ended, what? 65 million years ago, okay? Then you go back, 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 Mesozoic era, around 245 million years ago is when it started. When is school out? Around? 245. Oh, okay? Oh, okay? So school's out. 
What do you want to eat after school? You want to have your Snacks. dinner. Snack and dinner, okay? <laughs> what time do we have dinner? It's six. Okay, maybe about 545, because it's 545 million years ago. <laughs> so if you can remember, to remember your time periods, Cenozoic, think speed limit, somewhere around the speed limit. Mesozoic era started about the time school's out. Mm -hmm. And then the Paleozoic era started about dinner time. Anything before that? You have um, the pre-Cambrian. Does that help you? Like get the book now. When we look at what kind of things evolved during those times, the biggest, hugest steps occurred during the Paleozoic era. You had big jumps in the in the Paleozoic era. Mesozoic era, things you were looking at are things like reptiles and gymnosperms. You know this because the middle period of the Mesozoic era is the Jurassic. When you think of the movie, what? Jurassic Park, okay? So if you're going to have reptiles in the middle, okay, okay, that take a bite out of the middle of you, okay, that giant dinosaur, then you have to have already evolved everything else up to this point. Gymnosperms are things like Christmas trees and Hanukkah bushes, okay? These are leaves like needles, okay? You had the beginning and the divergence, and then you had angiosperms, which are like flowering plants and more broadleaf trees too, right? Um, and then that would come next. Um, mammals and the big dissemination of mammals happened during the Cenozoic era. So we're gonna walk our way through that. There's a great picture in your book um, called the Tree of Life. And um, this one shows kind of over time like how things would have evolved and the sequence in which the order they would have evolved. And I would, I had told you, you should take a look at that. That could, that could really help you. Okay, so let's start <clears throat> pre-Cambrian. So this is before Old and Pale. Okay, this starts when the Earth starts, formation of the Earth. Then about 3.5 billion years ago, oldest what? Fossils. Oxygen revolution, oldest eukaryotes, protists are evolving, diversifying, and then Edicarian, this are like your very first invertebrates, and they would be multicellular. This all happened during the Precambrian time. And think about, look at the time that's passing, billions of years, because the Paleozoic era, old and pale, started about dinner time, right? 543, 545, think dinner. That's when the Paleozoic era started. So on your notes, go to Precambrian time. Precambrian time is 87% of the total geologic time scale. 87%. Okay. Most of all time on this earth is during this Precambrian time. I gave you first cells. Um, I'm going to talk to you about um, stromatolites in just a minute. Go to number four, oxygen revolution, about two billion years ago, generating protective ozone. So very simple prokaryotic uh, microorganisms. Um, stromatolites are things that exist today. You can actually see them from space. They're bacteria that produce mucus and then sand gets trapped in them so they die and the ones that survive are on the edge. And then you have the combination of the salt water and the salts within the water and their mucus and the sand. Then another layer forms and another layer forms and another layer forms. And you know like if you cut down a tree and you could see time going back in the layer, in the rings of the tree, it's like that. If you cut these in half, you can see time going back. Okay, because they're preserved. Um, and stromatolites exist today. They exist in pre-Cambrian times. Um, I already explained about the mucus, and they keep moving outwards. Okay, so I gave you stromatolites are on there. Bacteria um, slash sand boulders still exist today. All right, so you needed to develop the ozone layer in order to protect but we couldn't develop an ozone layer until we had non-cyclic photophosphorylation come about, right? So this is all happening during pre-Cambrian time, that ozone shield. Okay, and then this brings us, once we had prokaryotic cells, 
How did eukaryotic cells evolve? Have we discussed this before? Yeah, yeah I introduced the endosymbiotic hypothesis that mitochondria and chloroplasts were probably once free living organisms that went to live inside of another prokaryote. Why do we say this? They're double membrane. They have their own DNA. That DNA is circular. It's not wound on histones like eukaryotic DNA. They're self-replicating. Their membranes act like cell membranes. So all that leads us to believe they were once free-living prokaryotes. How would membrane-bound organelles like ER and Golgi come about? All you would have to do is do what? Endosymbiosis, right? Uh, or sorry endocytosis, <laughs> sorry, I'm getting there eventually, and then you could have these membrane ribbons go throughout and be your endoplasmic reticulum, and then become your Golgi apparatus. So, um, oh, here are some fossils, yay. Um, here's geologic history simplified. Here you can see Precambrian, Paleozoic, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. I would encourage you, instead of grabbing a picture from my screen, you could probably find a simplified one that would be sharper you know, than grabbing my image on Google and just import that into your notes. A simplified um, geologic history. Because you can see what evolved from what on here. All right, so go to uh, number five, eukaryotic cell about two billion years ago, endosymbiotic theory. Um, the evidence, they are the right size, they have their own DNA, they are self-replicating, they divide by binary fission, two membranes, the outer membrane is like eukaryotes, the inner is like prokaryotes, and then I gave you an example of a fossil that was multicellular. Okay, this is what I would do on the fossil record because they're not going to ask you a particular period and what happens. I would not want to. I would want to know how did it start and how did it what end. And if you know how it ended, you know how the next one what started, right? So we need to know the bookmarks. Where did you begin? Where did you end on each of these time periods? So this one is showing you, and again, this is from your book too. Here's your Precambrian time. Here's your old and Paleozoic. What is circled right here? Mass extinctions. Mass extinctions. Changes on the dynamics on the Earth. Maybe a meteorite hit it, right? That could cause a mass extinction. Maybe you had changes in global weather patterns. Maybe as ice caps melted and it changed the salinity of the ocean water. It changed currents, which changed weather. But whenever you have a mass extinction, what did we say could happen as a result of a mass extinction? Adaptive radiation to fill the spot. And so you will see wherever you have mass extinctions, you will see this huge adaptive radiation that, that occurs. And then they kind of get pruned back because of natural selection. And then you might have another one as a result of that. Yes? No, 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 you're not, some of them like eliminated almost 90% of life that was existing, let's say in the ocean, but you still have, you're not, you don't have to re-evolve a cell anymore. You still have some remnants of things that would evolve from that. Okay, so let's look at the Paleozoic. Look what you are starting out with. First plants appear on land. So you're really starting at algae, and then you're ending the Paleozoic with who? Gymnosperms. Gymnosperms. So you're evolving from algae all the way through your early plants to more complicated plants all the way to Christmas trees and Hanukkah bushes. Now let's look at animals. You're starting with invertebrates and you're ending with the beginning of what? Reptiles. So just know the ends. You know where you started and where you ended. Because then you know the Mesozoic era started with who? Reptiles. The Mesozoic era started with gymnosperms. So if I look at the Paleozoic era, thank goodness there was an art artist around to paint it as it occurred. This is what you might see out in those open um, waters. This is the Cambrian period. Trilobites, this is one of those index fossils. You only find it um, during the Paleozoic era. And a molecular clock. This is, you don't measure time in seconds, but in the rate of mutations. 
because they have an idea about how fast mutations occur. So if you know that typically five mutations occur every million years, then how long ago did two organisms diverge if there are 20 mutations? Work it out with your bio buddy. This is a molecular clock based on mutations. If five mutations occur every million years, then how long ago did two species diverge if there are 20 mutations that separate them? Did you guess four? Okay. Because four go, five goes um, into, if you have 20 mutations, right? You divide. 5, 10, 15, 24, 4 million years. Okay. Um, so when we look at the Paleozoic era, okay, it started around dinner time, right? If we go back on either end, okay, and then here school is out, this is where we went from algae to gymnosperms, and then invertebrates to <laughs> invertebrates all the way to the beginning of reptiles. <laughs> all right. So go to your Paleozoic era, Cambrian animals, all life, the first word you need is all, and in molecular clock you need mutations, and then I need you to fix number three. Do you see how I have algae to ferns? What I really meant was algae to what? Gymnosperm. Okay, so now I have shown you a picture of a Paleozoic era and some of the creatures, but he would not exist during this time period because he didn't come about until the what? Mesozoic in the middle. Okay, so Mesozoic era, plant sperms, gymnosperms, beginning of angiosperms, animals go from, in the Mesozoic era, reptiles to early mammals. Reptiles to early mammals in your Mesozoic era, reptiles to early mammals. And the Cenozoic era, where we are right now, and again, you have pictures to kind of help you with this a little bit. Um, oh, here's some Mesozoic era. There are cycads. Okay, and the beginning of therapsids, which are gonna give you the beginnings of your mammals. So in the Cenozoic era, you have angiosperms to herbs. <laughs> Here would be an early mammal. Angiosperms to herbs and then animals, mammals all the way up. Mammals, we gotta keep going here. All the way up <laughs> to humans. Mammals all the way to humans. <laughs> okay, last but not least, you guys, because I want to close this out. You have already talked, we have already talked about this. Continental drift, okay? On continental drift, it explains why several different continents mirror each other and have shared geologic structures. It explains unique distribution patterns of several fossils and it explains unique mammalian diversity on different continents. So when the continents were all together, you see this one type of fern, kind of old, that spread all the way around, and that explains like even though they're, they're apart, these continents are apart, there's so many similarities, because at one point they were joined, so you would have similar fossils. And then mass extinctions, I've already talked to you about that, but I wanted you to have that. Um, that there are, the number you need to put in there, go under five mass extinctions, number two. There were three in the Paleozoic era, which ended with the great dying, 83% of all species. 83% of all species. And number three, when extinctions occur, new habitats open for other species. And the last little bit is, Rapid evolution of mammals, that's called adaptive radiation. Adaptive radiation. But we hit that part already as well. Read through that. When are we reviewing? I actually don't know, but it's somewhere on the show. Okay. Make good choices.